goals can be categorized as either approach goals or avoidance goals. And interestingly, there may be some kind of hemispheric specialization of these according to this notion of kind of dominant versus subordinate. And so the left hemisphere may be more uh, where you have your kind of active uh, approach goals that are represented and then avoidance being more kind of whatever subordinate uh, right hemisphere kind of activity. You know, the basic logic here is that if you have a positive outcome, you want to approach that. And if you have a negative outcome, you want to avoid that. And, and one of the key things about these avoidance things, which we'll see later, is it's hard to know when you've successfully avoided uh, a negative outcome, because, you know, if you avoid it now, you don't know if you continue to avoid it. And that turns out to be really critical for OCD obsessive compulsive disorder, as we'll look at uh, later in the um, disorders chapter. Approach goals are much more closely tied to action, right? So I want some positive thing and I devise a plan to go achieve and, and obtain that thing, right? I wanna go to the, to the grocery store and get a particular food item, that's easy. Avoidance goals are more complicated. Um, it's harder to turn them into action in some cases. And, it, and yet, you know, if you really want to actively avoid something, you do want to turn it into an action. You need to turn that negative outcome into a positive thing that you use to then avoid the negative outcome. And so there is a kind of further indirection in the case of these avoidance goals. So, you know, if I want to avoid getting sick, I need to take positive actions to wash my hands and avoid contact with others, et cetera. So every avoidance situation, if you're gonna do something about it, actually needs to turn into an approach for other kinds of actions that you're taking positively. And another interesting test case for this kind of approach versus avoid dimension is the uh, case of anger. So anger is a reaction to a negative outcome. It's some, some kind of uh, negative overall affect, but it's a more active response. So sadness, is a more kind of passive response. We'll see this in a moment when we start talking about emotion. It turns out that it ends up being uh, more left hemisphere coded as this kind of active response to these kind of negative things as opposed to a right hemisphere thing associated more with kind of these avoidance strategies. Another interesting case is how motivation plays out in the context of work. Uh, if you think about it, you know, somehow work seems like something nobody wants to do. Uh, somehow by definition, it's like effort, it's work. Why are we motivated to do work? What is it that drives that, that work motivation? Here again, you see these really important differences between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. If, if motivation was purely extrinsic or purely homeostatic, that's a weaker form of motivation. Um, but there are people who really become like workaholics and really become obsessed with work. And so what, you know, what's going on motivationally, uh, around this whole concept of work. And this is really a domain that is the, is studied a lot, obviously in the case of, uh, people who do research on industrial and organizational psychology, there's individual differences, these traits, uh, in terms of personality traits that we'll look at again in the social and personality chapter that have to play into the uh, tendency to want to work. So uh, perfectionism, conscientiousness, that desire to achieve order and organization and success, also kind of avoiding negative uh, outcomes tend to be motivational factors and trait factors that associate with higher tendency towards workaholism. But I think the most important thing that, that people have with associated with the concept of work is really this sense of self-efficacy this this idea that i am an important contributor to society in the work that i do and obviously this is something that is variable depending on the job and if you have a job that allows you to be more uh internally motivated in terms of what you're actually doing and kind of expressing your own individual contribution in that job, that's going to be something that drives more intrinsic motivation. So in my own personal case, when I had a job that was just kind of menial labor, I was particularly ineffective as an employee, very lazy and very, uh, you know, not very productive. Um, but when I had a job, uh, you know, certainly in academia and other cases where I had more 
control, more actual self-efficacy in my position, um, I was much more effective. And so this is really this fundamental challenge for, for, for thinking about work is how do you get people in a company, in a business environment to be motivated intrinsically, and yet you have things that need to get done. Those aren't necessarily the things that people would individually choose to do. And so, you know, balancing those different forces and coming up with ways to get people to really, you know, identify and, and express their self-efficacy in a work environment is really critical. And one of the key lessons from studying uh, motivation in the context of, of the work environment is the importance of setting really specific uh, uh, challenging goals for people. Uh, and so if you can really have something where they have a clear sense of making progress towards a specific outcome, but also something that's difficult and therefore kind of motivating and not trivial um, and something where they see sort of a clear purpose that really helps a lot. So uh, there's really a lot of scope for uh, understanding how these psychological principles of motivation apply in the real world. Uh, and you know, one of the main actual real world impacts of psychology and neuroscience is really helping understand how to, to get people to be motivated to do the things that need to get done. One particularly interesting challenging case in this, in this domain is uh, that's close to home here is grad school. Every year we recruit new grad students to our programs here. So the actual life of a grad student is, you know, long work hours. You're not making nearly as much money as your peers who went off into, you know, medic medicine or law or these other kind of professions or whatever. And then there's a really kind of low probability, unfortunately, of becoming in this, getting this position of being a professor, which actually is a pretty good job in some ways. In some ways, it's a lot of work, but uh, it is kind of very fulfilling in that respect. And you have a lot of personal freedom. And so, you know, it's like, what are the motivational structures? You have to have a really long-term sense uh, of possible outcomes. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, your your low your immediate term kind of situation is, you know, not as lucrative as it otherwise could be. You don't have a lot of extrinsic reward, but you do. And I think this is where it really you know, kind of understanding what, what goes on there is it, it's really a case of intrinsic motivation. And certainly this is what I tell my students and really look for in students is the only people who are really going to succeed in this kind of, you know, kind of adverse environment that, that, that they're facing are people who have that strong intrinsic motivation that you have some sense of, I really want to figure out the answers to these questions. I want to know how this stuff works. I want to solve these problems. I want to do real science. And, and that motivation has to be really strong to overcome all the kind of limited extrinsic motivational factors that, that are associated with this process. And so I think it's a good lens into this overall motivational world and really uh, selects for people who have really strong intrinsic motivation. And there is also some amount of like social coolness to some extent in some circles with being a grad student and getting your PhD. And so there is a, a social support there that that helps uh, uh, motivate, but really, ultimately, it's about that intrinsic motivation. Speaking of these social dimensions, there's, as we'll talk about in the social psychology chapter, so much of our, our motivation is tied to these social dimensions. So we're just going to really touch on this really briefly here, uh, this kind of affiliation. Um, uh, we need to we need to have some group that we belong to. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there may be some individual differences, uh, gender differences in how people approach this, but in general, um, we want to have, you know, some kind of groups that we're part of. Some people obviously have different, uh, set points for this. Um, but having that sense of like identity and belonging as part of a group helps nurture these kind of, uh, positive motivational systems. Like if you feel like, you know, things are tough but I'm in it with this other group of people who are experiencing the same kind of difficult situation, then those adversities become kind of, you know, actually beneficial. We can talk about them. It, it brings us closer together. And so those social forces can really play a critical role in overcoming adversity and driving motivation. Uh, you get all these very interesting cohort effects. Uh, I've seen this in different graduate groups that, you know, this at some random, uh, times in different graduate programs, you have like a, a really high percent uh, 
of the people in that graduate cohort go on to become, you know, influential professors. And it's kind of like, you know, there's these group interactions that each kind of member of that group kind of pushes the other to, to achieve uh, perhaps more than they would otherwise. And so those kinds of cohort effects really are evidence uh, perhaps of these kinds of social forces and in, in kind of encouraging people to go that extra extra distance to to do better than they otherwise would. So there's lots of kind of dimensions here. So you have the opposite side of loneliness, uh, feeling like you're not getting as much of this social belonging as you might want, and then the motivational you know benefits of intimacy, this ability to share you know your kind of deepest darkest secrets with others, which can be very cathartic uh, and 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 looking for that kind of uh, interactive relationship. Um, so you know, there's all kinds of different levels of uh, motivation that play out in the social world. Here we get to this really pressing, current, real world problem of uh, essentially social media. Okay, uh, so there's this you know uh, absolute perfect combination of all these motivational factors that are captured in this one technology. You basically have these kind of in-group, out-group, social belonging, really strong social forces playing out. Um, and then you also have these kind of frequent kind of news-driven dopamine bursts of something new and different happening. Um, and you have this, you know, this, this medium, this social media that actually kind of generates that dynamic. It taps right into the most core aspects of our motivational system. Frequent updates of progress and really strong social forces uh, and, and fostering those belonging things, but also, unfortunately, you know, the opposite side of that, the outgroup uh, hate kinds of dynamics. And again, we're really going to talk about that in the social psychology chapter. Uh, these are really the most important forces that shape our behavior and our our feelings and our, our motivations. And so uh, social media really has kind of managed to, to tap into these core aspects of our being. So it's not surprising that these are such dominant forces in our lives these days. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, these did exist in, in pre-social media technology, but that ability to turn this into a much more frequent online kind of you know dynamic thing that's constantly giving you these little dopamine bursts that's very different so you know people always love to gossip and they always love to get together and and, and chat and and these kind of things but with the constraints of the physical world you know you didn't get to do that like 24 7 and now with the with the technology you can do this all the time and so it's kind of this runaway sort of train wreck kind of situation as well that we're taking these things that are, that you know usually were moderated by normal physical constraints, and they they become unfettered with with physical constraints. And so we might want to think about ways of moderating these things because they are tapping really into these kind of core biological systems of motivation. So this is a, a challenge for our times. So how to how to deal with these things? How to it's kind of like drug addiction essentially. You know, if you think about it, uh, these are kind of uh, tapping into these endogenous pathways that are so strong in our brains. Um, and really, I do think we want to think about it in the same context as we think about drugs. Uh, drugs are likewise chemicals that tap into those existing biological pathways just exactly in the same way. And so uh, in the same way that we think about, you know, ways of dealing with drugs in, as a society and having awareness and having programs and addiction therapy and stuff like that, there are, there are the same kinds of issues really do apply here because it is exactly hijacking those same pathways.